getting the most out of every ingredient. That's the mark of a maker. The KitchenAid Blender Collection. Hello and welcome to this British Library Food Season Double Bill on this Saturday sponsored by KitchenAid. My name is Polly Russell and I'm a curator at the British Library and the curator and the founder of the British Library's Food Season. And this year I've had the real pleasure of working with Angela Clutton as the season's guest director. And as usual with the Food Season, what we wanted to do was to make sure that we had a whole host of events which were really diverse, really eclectic, but crucially really relevant. And in the context of COVID and what it's revealed about the fragility and the problems of the food season, today's double bill just could not be more relevant. We are starting with this fantastic panel, now for, uh, starting with this fantastic panel called Food Futures, Choices Facing Us Now with Tim Lang, Dee Woods and Sheila Dylan. And then going on this afternoon, a wonderful event called Beyond the Bank, Building Culture and Community Through Food with Bristol Square Food Foundation, My Grateful, Community Unity in Leeds and Brixton People's Kitchens. Both totally relevant, completely important events. Now for today's event. If you want to ask questions, please do. There's a form at the bottom of your screens. Please submit questions. If you would like to purchase books by any of the panelists, those are also available on your screens and they've all written wonderful books. So I implore you to do so. Um, and now though, I want to introduce you to today's chair, Sheila Dillon. No, many of you will know her as the presenter of BBC Four's food programme. Her programmes have included so many, but included groundbreaking editions on BSE, the rise of GM food, and so many more, many of which have helped move food issues from the margins to the mainstream in the media. She helped set up the BBC Food and Farming Awards, and she has won so many awards herself, I can't name them, but perhaps she's best summed up uh, by a city, uh, university, city University accolade, which stated that she has changed the way that we think about food. Over to your chair, Sheila Dillon. Thank you very much, Polly. And it is, as you say, I mean, there couldn't be a better moment to have this debate and there couldn't be two better people to talk about food futures, the choice facing us now, because the choices are really stark. Um, Dee Woods is the founder of Granville Community Kitchen. She's the winner of BBC Food Awards Cook of the Year. That's for cooks who change their communities. She's a food and political activist in so many ways, and she's an inspirer. Professor Tin Mlang really changed the landscape of the way we think and talk about food in Britain. And he's been an inspiration to me since I started at the Food Programme, which is rather a long time ago. And he broke completely new ground when he founded City University of London's Centre for Food Policy in 1994. And he's been professor of food policy at City since 2002 many important books he's written, including uh, his newest one, Feeding Britain, Our Food Problems and How to Fix Them. So there couldn't be two better people. Um, I, it's, this is a, a, I won't get to the questions yet because I, want, I would like you both to set out your stall as it were. And let's, let's begin with you, Tim, because you have been thinking and writing about our food futures. What, what would you say, you know, what, what food futures, what are our choices, Tim? Uh, it, it, the future depends on what we think the problems are, where we want to go. I mean, the data, the evidence says we do in Britain, and I'll come to the world in a bit, have glaring problems of inequalities. Diet has gone from being a problem of underconsumption to being one of malconsumption and overconsumption. We have a problem of obesity and overweight, and look at how that's up with us with COVID 19. Uh, we've got a major problem of ecosystems, foods, the, and agri food, the biggest drivers of biodiversity loss, water use, you name it, huge problems there. But there is, a, I think, a, a critical issue which is peculiarly British, which I think Polly will agree as a historian which is that Britain, because it had an empire, because it had a very powerful navy, 
and was triumphant after the Napoleonic Wars, essentially by the mid 19th century decided it wouldn't feed itself. It would let others feed itself. And while we no longer have an empire and it went after World War II, uh, essentially we've begun to be fed by Europe. We've, we produce about 50, 60% of our own food, depends how you calculate it. Uh, and I think that is now a very big issue. And, and it's the sleeping elephant in the room uh, about food and the future. But starkly, we've got to decide whether Britain wants to engage with those macro problems of ecosystems, health, inequalities, and so on, or whether it just wants to carry on with business as usual, but shift from being fed by Europe to, say, being fed by the United States or by there are some people in the government who actually even just want to get a sort of neo-empire approach and be fed by the Commonwealth, I've heard people say. And others who are just straightforward globalists who say, it doesn't matter where we get it, as long as it's cheap from anywhere in the world. Those are very big choices. And others think, well, in the end, we'll have to get it from Europe because it's only 24 miles away. Well, those are big choices. I think those macro choices are actually the big politics of food at the moment. But to address those, and I'll end on this issue. Um, we've really got to decide, Dee and I know each other well on this, we've got to decide whether we think food is just a matter of price, quality and availability. The classic UN four A's, access, availability, affordability, etc. Or whether we want to include those wider issues of ecosystems and health as well. And that means we've got to rethink governance. And there is a very big problem. We've got it over trade in Britain in the internal market over Northern Ireland. Is Northern Ireland having no border with Southern, with the Republic? Or is the border going to be uh, about three miles from where I'm talking to you from at Hollyhead? In other words, is that going to be the border? Uh, we've got to actually discuss the governance of food. And there, that's very tricky. It's where the politics with the capital P really kicks in. And so I think part of the choices that I've sketched will only be determined if we get a grip of the politics, the processes, because food, as we all know, isn't just what we eat, it's how we eat and how those decisions are made. Is there going to be companies setting food standards in trade deals or is it going to be the government? If we're leaving the European Union, which we have, who's going to set food standards? That's what we use this very pompous word, governance. So I see the problems ahead as being doable, but only if we accept what they are. But then we've got choices about where do we want to go? Atlantis is globalist, produce more, be more resilient, have more of our own defense. These are big choices. And I just think the public's not being engaged with it. So the one thing I want is public engagement, which is why we do things like this. Steve, can you set out what you think the future, what, what the problems we're facing now and what you think the solutions might be? Um, so I thoroughly agree with Tim on what those problems are. And to sort of follow on from that, you know, it is about governance. And if you're thinking about governance, we need to think about democracy and how our rights are being eroded as citizens in this country, but not just citizens in terms of nationality, but as food citizens. So we need to rethink what food is. We need to reimagine what food is. And food is more than, you know, a price. It's more than being a consumer product right? Food is life, right? Food connects us all. Food, food is love, food is society, food is culture. And we need to imbue food somehow with all these qualities that, and value it more. Um, so for me, it is about reimagining our food systems. And this time is actually a good time to pivot. The only thing missing for me is that we're not focusing enough on the local. And I'm sitting here in a farm in East Devon, 
you know, d discussing this. Why, how, how can we produce more food? How can we engage, you know, with our population, right, in all its diversity to become part of this food production, food distribution, and then we trade. Once we have a strong home base, then we trade with other parts of the world. But I think that is the issue for right now. We need to build our own food security right here in the UK. And base that on the principles of food sovereignty on agroecology. So human rights, workers' rights, um, the ecology, um, and taking on board, you know, all these mul multiple crises that we have right now. So in terms of climate, in terms of hunger, um, with hunger being a symptom of poverty. So we have food inequalities. So we could only address those food inequalities to a certain degree by a food system, but it is about, you know, ch challenging the decision makers. We have to challenge the decision makers to do something about inequality in the UK. Thank you. I mean, I mean, you're both agreed, you know, we're, I think there is a common agreement amongst people who are engaged in the, in looking at the food system, but you say, um, Tim, that, you know, about engaging the public. I mean, it's clear that the public at the moment is not engaged. How, how is this process going to happen? I mean, the government is, it seems indifferent. I think actually I'm going to be more optimistic than you, Sheila. I think the public in my working lifetime, I've worked in this for 45 years, um, has got more and more engaged. When I was a child um, in, in the 1950s, um, British food was brown. Um, it, it's become more colourful. It's become more international. It's been heavily influenced by Europeanization. And whether you use focus, date, food, focus group data or opinion polls, uh, just over time, interest has grown, partly fueled by crises, you know, the mad cow disease, BSC, being a great moment where the British public began to wake up. Um, so I don't think it's all bad. I think the, 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 the big leap forward, and I agree with Dee in what she was saying, it's a, the sort of a ratchet up to the next level of food democracy that's needed. We don't have a food committee in the House of Commons. Um, there was actually an interministerial food committee set up in 2007, 8, 9. It was abolished in 2010. I think the COVID-19 and the leaving the European Union is leading towards more structures coming in. So I think whether we look at public attitudes or whether we look at the state, which the current government was very reluctant to get engaged with this, but it's being forced to. And when you see the road haulage industry and the retailers really expressing extreme irritation with government that it still doesn't know how or whether food's going to come through the channel tunnel. I mean, I think the politics is waiting to emerge into a new phase. So I'm more positive about, about the situation. I think there has been a growth of interest, but we haven't got the big change that I think both Dee and I want. And that won't happen until, you know, the governance gets sorted out. And that is being forced on us by leaving the European Union. The British public doesn't want chlorinated chicken, doesn't want hormone fed beef. Meanwhile, Mrs. Truss is doing a deal to get that, uh, but it's being put on hold. And you notice the American government is refusing to do a deal, um, whether Republican or Democratic uh, government, uh, 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 until, Northern Ireland and the Ireland politics is sorted out. I think this is bringing the pressure on government, whether, whether it likes it or not. So I'm more positive, even though the situation is messy, than I think you are, Sheila. Well, I'd, I'd like to ask you both what, what, um, what you take from the House of Lords uh, rejecting the government's, um, as it did the other day, the government's trade bill. Um, do you think this is going to, along with the pressures from 
the US, as you've just described him. Do you think this is going to actually change the government's mind in any way? Well, the government's got a I'll leap in first, Dee. Uh, the, the government's got a massive majority, can do what it likes. But it's very interesting that the Lords did do that. It's very interesting that even Republican senators and Congress people in the States, the USA, uh, actually said to the British government, sorry, you can't do this. Actually, now that's really shaken the cabinet. They did not expect this. They thought they were going to get a very easy Trump deal. Uh, which food was there. They thought there would be problems with the British consumer uh, uh, getting upset about uh, chlorinated chicken. And that's really a symbol. You know, I mean, I, I, my friend Eric Milstone and I did that work. So at one level, we're pleased it's become a meme of what's at stake. But there's much more than that. It's about the American model of intensive agriculture versus a European model that Britain's not quite sure whether it wants to carry on or, or abandon. So there are these quite right. There are huge choices facing farming, but the big issue is the British consumer. There are 66 and a half million British consumers. There are only about 300,000 farmers. Uh, uh, and farming gets a lot of publicity, but it's not the food system. Sheila, you know, and Polly knows, we all know. The catering industry is 1.8 million people working. Farming is tiny. It should get more money. Uh, than it gets, but the industry is really being brought to its knees by COVID-19. So I think the picture I'm trying to paint, to summarise it in one sentence, is that bit by bit, whether government likes it or not, reality is being forced on it. And I think the public is not stupid. It sees this and it's gradually getting more engaged and interested in it. So I'm hopeful about that. Well, I'm glad you're hopeful. Do you, are you hopeful? Do you um, see yeah, hope? definitely hopeful. Um, and, you know, agree with Tim, you know, the public are getting more engaged, I think, through mutual aid groups and what was happening on the ground in terms of communities coming together to feed, feed themselves. People are much more interested in where their food comes from, um, who's producing it, and... You know, they, they want to be involved in, in that decision making. And so, Dee, you and, Dee, you and I would agree. I mean, the, the COVID-19 has really shaken a lot of people. Dee and I are both on the London Food Board for the, the for non-partisan for the uh, mayor of London. And we're under Boris Johnson. Um, you know, the government thought that only about one and a half million people would need special attention in COVID-19. It's eight million. It's yeah. eight million in the sixth richest economy on the planet not being adequately fed. And people who were shocked when colleagues and I wrote an open letter to the Prime Minister and to Secretary of State for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs and the head of Public Health England, saying, look, you've got to ensure that everyone in a crisis gets well fed. Polly and I know as historians, she's the proper historian, but I know as an amateur historian, you know, how effective rationing was and the role of the government making sure that everyone was decently fed or reasonably well fed in World War II was for morale. We're entering a situation where in dire circumstances, which COVID-19 could carry on for years, I had a very elite uh, briefing on it yesterday, you know, some of the modelling, well, almost all the modelling is showing it going on for two, three years, in which case this problem ain't going to go away. And the government knows it's got a problem with food poverty. So I, I think really, I was really interested to read in the Lancet uh, in the last few days, uh, where Richard Horton, the editor, yeah. was saying that it's not a pandemic; it's a syndemic. And yes, it is. That science has been far too narrow and concentrating on controlling the virus and ignoring the fact that what we're seeing is a conjunction of the virus and non-communicable diseases, which rise out of inequality and obesity and heart disease and high blood pressure. And that if you don't address those two things together, you will never deal with a virus and the virus <laughs> will come afterwards. Yeah, she, the, the notion of syndemics came from a Lancet commission for, run by, you know, mates of mine. Um, uh, so I'm very aware of that knowledge. It's, it's not just the non chemical diseases and the uh, foodborne diseases like, um, uh, you know, 
pathogens. Uh, it, it's combining with climate change. It's climbing, combining with the biodiversity loss. And that's the problem. The enormous channel challenge that food represents is, and you're asking DME to say what sort of future we got. Well, the future, there will only be a future if we sort out the food system to lower the impact uh, of food on emissions of climate change gases, on biodiversity, water use, etc. And D and I will argue, as good sort of social oriented people, that won't happen unless we look after all the people. If we're only yeah. looking after the rich, forget it. The rich, the rich actually need the poor to suit their interests, but really those. And we're at a very, uh, Polly, block your ears as a historian, we're at, a, I think, a 1930s sort of position where the politics is emerging, but the solutions haven't yet been grasped, how enormous they've got to be. You've got to restructure um, the income of the poor if you want people to be healthy from their diet. At the moment, people on low incomes eat a lousy diet, get fat, fatter even than the rich, uh, uh, and eat very little fruit and vegetables. Yeah. Sorry? I said the rich are thin, that's the mark of being rich. That's right, absolutely. You know, uh, obesity and overweight are uh, social gradient diseases. So yeah. the, the enormity is about putting all of these things together. And that's what the notion of syndemics represents. The syndemics commission of the Lancet is a brilliant report that says it's about putting all of these bits together. Well, food, we all, all of us on this call know that food is complex. It's not just, it's values, yeah. it's income, and, it's culture. And D, I mean, how do you see this? Because, I mean, you work in an area uh, where most people are poor they don't they're they're hard up they have they struggle to feed themselves well yeah and of course the establishment argument is not just a government argument in the uk you know it's it's that cheap food is necessary because yeah. people are poor and people like us uh, you know in this debate are privileged and we're middle class and you know what are we talking about we don't understand the world you do understand that world what would you say to that argument um you know, cheap food, as, as I've said before, is costing us all. You know, it costs people's health. Um, you know, people are sick, people are dying. And, and it's costing our, our planet, right? Because we're using industrialized methods, right, to produce masses of, of cheap food. And it's killing, it's killing everything, right? So people deserve good food, right? People have a right to good food. Everyone does. So we need to change our political systems, right? So that it enables people to have good food. And I think that's where communities are coming in because we cannot wait on government to do that, which is why communities are looking at farming um, and producing food for themselves. Communities are training themselves up, right? But also that political education as well to advocate for others because not everyone can speak to politicians, to government um, or, or write policy or influence policy. But we need the people who are most affected at the center of any change because when ones who understand. Tim, when I was um, a much younger journalist, I remember meeting you and you saying to me that you could never, you know, don't worry about government, that the change will always come from the bottom up. Um, you know, and that, that's always cheered me as I've, you know, as I sink into my sometimes too um, easy uh, pessimism. You feel as optimistic about that now as you did then? Changes to the bottom up. Uh, I'm smiling because I remember saying that, and yes, I do still say that, Sheila. But I have to remind you of my mother, who would now be, I think, uh, she'd be nearly a hundred years old, uh, and is uh, is not with us anymore. She always said that I spoke uh, as an optimist because um, I came out of her backwards. I was a breech baby. In other words, I'm sort of perversely uh, optimistic, despite the evidence. The evidence is not good, uh, but I am 
still optimistic about the sorts of things that Dee was saying and the, the slow zigzagging growth of public awareness and interest. Um, because I think in the end that does become the political pressure. You can have as many intellectual arguments as you like inside government, outside government, among people like us at the British Library or whatever. Um, but ultimately, unless it becomes a mass issue, you don't get the big changes. And I think that's building up in a very, very interesting way. Whether, and I nearly uh, asked to comment on what Dee was saying, the evidence is that uh, people on low incomes have not that different sets of values of what they want from the food than people who are rich, actually. They just can't afford to do it. Um, they watch the TV, they see the environmental problems. There are a lot of people who aren't interested, but there are growing numbers of people who are. So I'm, my optimism is from that, Sheila, that there is a growth of awareness, there's a growth of experimentation, like Dee is talking about. The upsurge of the food movement in Britain is remarkable, you know. Just, there are hundreds of groups. This week, I was on a climate change citizens jury in Kendall, which we think is the first one of any town in Britain. I mean, it was remarkable what these people were asking, what they were thinking of, how could they get more farmers in the locality growing shorter supply chain routes. People are thinking in a very imaginative way. So, but the big issues are framed beyond what we can do at the local level. I'm a, I'm a localist, but I think it's the regional and the national we've got to sort out as well. And that's tricky. That is tricky. That's where I've become a very sober academic. So I, have, I think I have lost my marbles. I'm still optimist, but the evidence isn't good in some places. But I think if people keep on getting more and more interested, you and Polly are so important in that process, uh, then my optimism remains. <laughs> I'm glad. Uh, Dee, I, I think about when I first met you and, and we were judging for the BBC um, Food Awards and you talked about how you'd found this kitchen in West London that wasn't being used and you just got in there and stuck in. What would you, and you started cooking and you got all these people involved in cooking and all these people involved in eating and you, you change things. But how would you describe, I mean, here's Tim talking about that kind of movement, making him optimistic, and, you know, and then against the, the big problems. How would you describe the change that you've seen in your area of West London? You know, as I said before, a tough area. Because um, I think, you know, apart from getting people in, we went out to where people were. And I think meeting people where they are is an important thing. So we've never forced anything on the local people. What we created was a safe space where people can come, sit, eat, discuss, um, and eat good food. And that has just sort of mushroomed into this very active community who knows what they want. And they want change. They want good housing. They want good food. Um, they don't want HS2, you know, coming through. And have, and you know, we supported that community in building their, you know, political acumen, and to be able to, you know, meet with sort of people from HS2 and with sort of the MP and. Lo local yeah, councillors and, and whatever, all right? We have people who've become in, involved with Friends of the Earth in terms of climate and pollution. And so, you know, I think it is trusting that people have the capacity and it is supporting people to be able to do that. And I think probably our biggest fight is trying to save save our building. And we have brought so many people along with that. And yeah, I think the power of community is really, really important, really important. And it's, it's still growing. We're still bringing people with us. 
You know, we have people who receive food aid, but they're volunteering. They're supporting our new projects. You know, people are hungry for change, seriously hungry for change and want to be part of that change. I was thinking about just that hungry for change in a program that we made this summer with um, some teenagers from the Food Foundation who had been, they were leading, they were part of the, you know, their childhood food poverty. And they had been recording um, children, teenagers all over Britain who struggling with the same issues. And one of the things that came up was that hardly any of them could cook. And sometimes this is seen as a trivial question, you know, how important, you know, against these big things of inequality and, you know, the power of, uh, of agribiz, et cetera, how important is knowing how to cook? I think it is extremely important because um, once you have that skill and experience, you can feed yourself better. You can feed others better. But we have to understand in terms of poverty that impacts on what you eat. It means sometimes not having access to equipment. You know, so we have landlords who would not permit you to have nothing more than a microwave. Um, it is also about having broken equipment or you're a refugee or asylum seeker in a hostel. So absolutely no equipment. So it is extremely important. And the younger that people learn to, to cook, the better. So I still have my first cookbook. I learned to cook when I was pro what, probably about six or seven. And that has always stayed with me, as well as, you know, being sort of really enraptured by the natural world and food and taste of food and animals and, you know, just, just making all the connections. And if we could give our children that type of education, right, I think, you know, we're, we're building up the next generation of activists and actionists and people who, who, who will make that change. Kim, do you think our food future includes everybody having that skill? Uh, well, I'm, I'm with Dee that I think skills are really important. For me, well, my lovely colleague Martin Carrer and I, 25 years ago, I think more, did a, um, a, a much cited study for the then Health Education Authority about why teach people to cook. Um, and it's a question that has run through my working life ever since. The answer is in one sentence, control. If you've got the skill to be able to cook, you know what's in it, and you can then compare and contrast what you get when you go and buy a ready-made one. Um, Britain, have, having been an optimist, should I'm now going to be um, dampening my own enthusiasm. Britain eats the most of all of us, of all Europe, start sentence again, of all European countries on which there's good data, Britain eats the, the diet most containing ultra processed foods. That doesn't mean to say processing can be bad. What we mean by ultra processing is foods which are high in salt, sugar and fat. In other words, they're basically food from anywhere. The cheap commodities used to make something look like the real thing. Um, and Britain has the most. Uh, and there's no wonder that we're catastrophically bad when it comes to diet and health. And that goes back to the mid-19th century. I'm looking at Polly. You know, those big decisions that were made by the state, a fight went on inside the British state in the 1820s to mid-1840s, culminated in the repeal of the Corn Laws, where Britain basically said, OK, we're not going to protect our farmers. We're just going to go and get food from anywhere. We've got the Navy to protect it. Um, that model is out of date, but the culture of that is still in place. You can get food from anywhere. Um, cooking is the antidote to that. Uh, at one level, I have a cookbook deed that I only got about 30 years ago. Cooking is a revolutionary act, uh, which made me laugh then and still makes me laugh now. But I know what it means. It's about taking back control, knowing 
what real food can be. And, and you know, you and your programme, Sheila, have been so important in that, and the TV programmes. One level, they're pornography. You watch them, but don't do it. At another level, they're very real reminders to Britain that we can actually have food as pleasure, not just food as fuel which is what the 1840s decision led to, cheap food being the number one criteria. So for me, cooking is very important, but I don't want to make everyone to cook. I think it's lovely not to cook, actually. There's something very nice about the growth of the hospitality sector, the growth of ready-made foods. They're fantastic, actually. They can be fantastic. But the point is, what quality and how? And are you made dependent on it? Is that the cheapest way to get food? Those are the really subtle things. But if you can't cook, you don't understand that last bit, which is taking raw foods and turning them into what you want uh, to make your life better and happier and more culturally appropriate for yourself. So cooking is very important to me, actually. Uh, and I think it is in the, in the little everyday sense. It's a revolutionary act if you cook, actually. You're saying no to Tesco. You're saying no to Unilever. You're saying no to the very big corporations which increasingly dominate food. Uh, you know, you, if you want a burger, you can make it yourself. Uh, that's more complicated, you know, but then when you know what a real burger is like, uh, you start asking different questions and you say, do I want a cheap one every day or a really good one once a month? And those um, sort of questions follow. But I don't know if Dee would agree with that. Um, yeah, definitely. And I think what we had a glimmer of hope um, with, with this pandemic, with people not being able to access supermarkets and, you know, buying into local box schemes and people just, just cooking more. And for me, that is a glimmer of hope. One of the things that happened in COVID-19, actually, I will be political with a capital P here. I think it was a catastrophic mistake by the government to close down hospitality. Dee and I know, I mean, I think for two years on the London Food Board, I gently kept hitting the table and saying, we must deal with the Resilience Forum. Under the Civil Contingencies Act 2004, it is the duty of every region to have a Resilience Forum. I do talks up and down the country and people have never heard of them. This is what is supposed to be there to prepare for crises like COVID-19 and food didn't feature at all. Well, in London, we began to get, as Dee notes, we began to get our resilience forum beginning to think about food, and it's not giving away trade secrets. The first finding of the work we did over a year was that really no one had a clue where London's food came from, and the retailers didn't want to share that information. And what happened in COVID-19 was the government basically handed the entire food system to nine retailers, and they've done incredibly well. They've skyrocketed their sales and their home deliveries and things. Meanwhile, the hospitality sector that I think could have been really helpful in turning its skills and its capacities in a different direction was thrown onto the scrap heap. Watch what's happening now. It's again the hospitality sector being thrown to the scrap heap. So here you're seeing some hard politics, Sheila, coming into jobs, the economy, profit, control, hitting on the back of COVID-19. This is going to be really serious politics with the capital P. Why do you think, um, I mean, it seems extraordinary as you explain it in that way, that the government could have ignored the hospitality industry, which is such a huge part of the economy. How could they have done that? The, the hospitality, I'm gonna be really hard now as a seasoned watcher. Um, the hospitality sector has been very hard to organise, very hard to uh, get the voice that it deserves by the size of it. Um, it's been weak. And I'm not being nasty about the industry there. I'm just reporting the reality. It's a fragmented industry. There are some giant corporations which dominate contract catering. Two companies, one French, one British, uh, have about 15% of the contract catering market of the world. And, and the same about that in Britain. Uh, I, I think it's about that anyway, don't quote me. But very powerful. And then you've got tens of thousands of small businesses and some small chains which have got slightly bigger, you know, the Leons and things. Um, it's a fragmented industry and it hasn't had a powerful voice. 
uh, whereas the retailers are ruthless, very well prepared. The food manufacturing sector, it's the oldest lobby in, in Britain, is the food manufacturing sector. So these and the farmers, very powerfully well organized. Hospitality has been weak. It's easy to get rid of. That's my hard answer, Sheila. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, it comes back to that question of governance. You know, who controls our food system? The big corporations and big businesses or our government who represents the interests of people? That sort of brings up um, a question I was going to ask about Henry Dimbleby's um, national food strategy, because the word resilience is, you know, at the heart of it. And, and in all his talks, Henry Dimbleby has has used this word. I mean, D, what how would you what do you think he means by that and how important is it? Um, I think, you know, resilience means being able to with, withstand shocks. And we sort of withstood the, the shock of the pandemic to a certain degree, but the impacts have been, you know, I think it's so, so irreparable, right? I don't think hospitality is going to come back anytime soon. Um, so, we need, we need to look at what those gaps are. We need to look at, you know, what, why hospitality, why certain aspects of, of, you know, our food industry suffered the way we did. So we don't have that resilience. Um, and I don't think we're, we're really seeing the full effects yet. I know prices are going to be going up. Um, the predictions of global food shortages so we don't have that, that resilience and we need to build that resilience by looking at the entire, you know, and I think I, we have more than one system. We have sy systems and we need to unpick those systems to see how they work. So yes or no, we have some resilience, but not much. I agree with that, Sheila. The, um, I was just looking, at, you kindly mentioned my Feeding Britain book. Um, one of the things I really explored at great length for, for the reasons Dee's just said was you know, our capacity of, of, of food growing. We have 18.7 million hectares of land in Britain, um, about 6 million, that's one third of those. Uh, are what's called croppable. They might grow grass, uh, they might grow intensive horticulture, but only 165,000 hectares, that's a tiny proportion, not even 1%, less than 1%, uh, is down for horticulture. Um, so land and land ownership and, and the use of land is very important if you want to aim for resilience. So when I talk with Henry Dimbleby, I say, look, resilience can be, is a term a bit like, um, sustainability. It's used by arch right-wing capitalists or left-wing eco-warriors. It means different things to different people. If you use resilience of a food system in the ecological sense, exactly as Dee said, the capacity to bounce back after shock and, and to continue to deliver capacity, well, we ain't got that. And we've shown it in COVID-19. Uh, the horticulture industry, I've just had an email from a leading person in British horticulture, literally today. Um, uh, uh, they've not got the labour force. People are planning not to grow food next year. So in other words, you've got the land, you've got the facilities, but you haven't got the labour force. Now that is a critical example of where food resilience is completely missing in Britain. It's rhetorical, not real. And if you want to really look soberly, as I do in my professional work, at the world's food system, we've got to sort out uh, the mismatch between land use, human capacity, human need for health and food. And we're not doing it. And Britain is still assuming others will feed it. We've been fed 40% plus from the European Union. We've chosen to leave. And now we don't want to know. A current state, the British food industry is saying 
fresh fruit and vegetables will go up by 30% if there's a no deal. If Mr. Gove's fantasy of a no deal Brexit occurs, really big price rises are going to happen. That's not me saying it, that's the industry saying it. So resilience comes down to very practical things like lorries coming through the Channel Tunnel without any delays to suit the just-in-time food systems of the retailers. If you really want ecological resilience, you've got to go the way that D's going. You want to have more regional foods, you want to have more foods coming short supply chains to people, and you want people not having to be reliant upon a factory. That's a very different version of resilience. 100% agree with that, Tim. I feel like this hour is inadequate to really explore these extraordinary things. Like we've come to the point where we're going to our questions from, from our audience, from our virtual audience. And um, one, the first question is, what do uh, Dee and Tim think are the good bits of the recent food report produced by Henry Dimbleby? And, and what not, what's not so good? But let's, let's talk about the good things. Um, you go first, Dee. I welcome the bits around sort of building or, or rather relieving some aspects of food insecurity. So the increase in the value of a healthy start voucher, um, extended no recourse to public funds, but we, we need to understand that those are only sticky plasters, right? We still need to have proper solutions. Um, I think that was about it. Okay, yeah. Tim, what's the good thing for you? I think the good thing is that it is happening. Uh, remember after the banking and commodity crisis of 2007-8 when oil doubled, went to 100 barrel, dollars a barrel and food commodity prices on the world markets doubled as well. Suddenly you got the rich world, which we're part, uh, saying, oh my God, we thought food was a problem for Africa or for the starving billions, but not us. And they suddenly realized it was us. I remember talking right at the top level uh, and seeing this enormous shock go in and thinking, holy Moses, we've got to do something about it. They did, they worked like mad. Britain actually developed a really coherent food policy around food security, welfare, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, by 2010, and then came the coalition government and just abolished the lot. We've had 10 wasted years. So the answer, the best thing about the national food strategy, Henry Dimbleby's first thing, is that it exists. And it makes me go mad. And I've written really rude notes to Henry Dimbleby, saying, if you keep saying this is the first for 75 years, uh, it's a total lie. It's actually the first for nine years. And, and the, this government, or its remnant uh, uh, in the past, abolished really very careful across industry, very careful coordination. So it's terrific. We're getting something. The bad news is it's coming too late. You know, all the big issues of trade, et cetera, no deals, et cetera, will have been determined by the time the real report comes out. But I'll add the, in, in its content, the thing I really cheered about, Sheila, and D was the wealth that the Henry Dimbleby acknowledged the enormity of the welfare crisis. I mean, he's been well advised. He's under criticism from some of the right wing conservatives that he's going native. He's not sticking the hard line that he should be doing in the sort of go right view. Um, but it's really terrific. He acknowledged the enormous, the 8.1 million. You know, the Food Standards Agency says 7.8 million people are going without food in COVID. Uh, the Food Foundation, 8.4 million. You know, these are big numbers for the sixth richest economy in the world. It is terrific that Dimbleby has recognized that. Whether he'll be able to deal with that in a way uh, that uh, in the final report that requires universal credit, the welfare system, all sorts of things to change, food resilience forums to work properly. I'm not sure, you know, I, I personally, I wish him well, um, but it is good that it's happening, but wow, it's a big challenge because we've got to deal with climate change, we've got to deal with water, we've got to deal with floods, we've got to deal with infrastructure. Now I'm going to make you depressed, you <laughs> Um, a question here uh, on food standards. Food standards and food labeling, if they're not governed by the EU, how will that be dealt with? Mm -hmm. Shall I go on that, Dee? Uh, yeah. 
Um, well, let, let me be very academic, with difficulty. The food standards agency is weak. It's lost. It's already broken up. Scotland's gone its own way. So England and Wales are on their own. We don't know whether Northern Ireland will work to European standards because of the loose or the hard border. All of that is up in the air. Um, we've just lost access to 33 institutions at the European level which underpin food standards. And I don't, it's one of the big things Dimbleby's got to resolve. And it's why, to, to be critical about the Dimbleby report, the first part, he, he, I think, has caved in to the Trade and Agriculture Commission idea that that's going to somehow uh, a little part-time organisation with no food specialists on it is going to resolve what, what are good food standards. Uh, I fear that we will drop down to Codex Alimentarius Commission standards. And that, for those who don't know, is the UN body which is run jointly by the World Health Organization and the FAO. There's, I've studied that. It's a very huge, about 2,000 people over a two, three-year cycle operates. They set standards, but they're the lowest of the low, if you like, they're minimum. So the question is a very good question, and the answer is we don't know. We do not know who is going to do it. We do not know how it's going to be done. The Trade and Agriculture Commission, some people are pushing for that in the Conservative Party, for that to continue and to be put on the proper footing. If it is, it's a bit like COVID-19. You know, the SAGE group had no one from public health on it until the independent SAGE was created. And I've argued with my colleagues, we should be arguing for an independent trade commission so that uh, really we flush out the idiocy of a, a trade commission setting food standards where it's got no food standards experts on it. You know, you couldn't make it up. It's ludicrous. Uh, but the people will see that and they won't like it. They don't want co they don't want correlated chicken, <laughs> a committee that hasn't got any experts on it saying, oh, it's all right, we'll do a deal with Mr. Trump. And that won't go down very well, if Mr. Trump is really ah, Oh, Tim. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm still an optimist, Sheila. I'm still an optimist. <laughs> I'm putting this question to Dee. Um, the problems yeah. associated with food, diet, environment, hunger just seem so huge. What would you both, but you first in D, encourage people to do to make a difference at an individual level? I mean, we don't want to be overwhelmed by despair. What can you do as an individual? Yeah. Um, I think we're beyond sort of individual actions in terms of, you know, making better choices at the supermarket. I think this is about people coming together. We have to find our communities. We have to support farmers. We have to, you know, support those, those organizations and businesses who are making a difference. So it is about committing to that. Find one of those things, you know, if it's hunger, find a poverty, um, anti-poverty organization and commit to doing some work there. You know, if it's farming, find your local food producer and commit to them. But, you know, we need to be coming together as people and working on this. Tim, one... Well, I'm going to be, I'm going to be the boring academic, Sheila, which I am, as you know. Um, I, I think... The things we can do individually is to quietly reject ultra-processed foods where we can. I think we can eat less but better is pretty good rubric. If you're well off, if you're not well off, just do everything you can to prioritize food as a really important part of household budgets. And that's easy to say. I, I did my first ever research on food poverty in 1981-82 in Manchester, and Sheffield and Blythe Valley. You know, it's easy to say, well, you could do it well if you've got a really big well-stocked kitchen and you could live on £9.32 for a, a feed 14 people on it. it. It's really hard if you're on low income. I, I would like to be optimistic and say, I think, you know, uh, I'm with Dee on this. Food is about pleasure. It's about sociability. Eat with others if you can. But the boring academic in me has to say, cut down on the, the ready-made foods and, and eat more fruit and vegetables if you can. It's catastrophic, the, the underconsumption of fresh fruit and vegetables in Britain. It's catastrophic. Uh, and rich and poor, it's bad, uh, but it gets worse and worse the lower down the income level you can. So if one's on really low income, 
really the more you can prioritize having fresh fruit and vegetables and, and good raw ingredients. And that's where we come back to Dee's point about cooking. Cooking, if you're doing the labor, you're not paying someone else to do it. it doesn't, the economics don't always work out actually. Sometimes, you know, factory food can be much cheaper than we can ever produce it at home. Uh, a factory made pizza can be made much cheaper than I can make one. Um, but if you make pizza yourself, it'll be better quality and you'll feel better and you'll have the pleasure from it in sharing it with others. Um, so simple foods, I think, is actually something I find myself increasingly talking about. Saying, eat less, eat simply. Um, you know, but get pleasure from it. Food's about pleasure. Yeah, there was an earlier question, um, which I sort of I, 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 um, ignored, but I think um, it said, does D think there's a politics and power to pleasure in terms of food? Huh. And it just means good. like we focus on the negative aspects of our relationship with food. Yeah, yeah, Do you good. think more about pleasure, D? Um, yeah, definitely. And it doesn't matter if you can't afford a big extravagant meal. I think the pleasure comes from sharing that meal with other people. You know, it's like community gardens, you know, and pleasure comes from producing that food together. So for me, it, it is all about that common in or commons and valuing food as that essential human resource that, that we all need. We all need to eat. Yeah, that's well said. Sorry, Tim? Uh, uh, I got interested in food when I was doing a doctorate. My doctorate was on phobias, and you know they're, they're the opposite of pleasure, uh, which is why I'm with D all the way. I think uh, to, trying to build the pleasure out of food, even if we're eating less, but getting more pleasure from it is really important. And for me, gardening is actually very important. One of the things I find very hopeful in COVID-19 is more people wanting to have access to gardens and being out there. And we know when people... Uh, can grow just some bit of food, even if it's just herbs. They get the pleasure of the relationship of, of from, from seed to their mouth. Um, that pleasure principle seems to me such an important antidote to phobias. And one of the bad things, Sheila, that's happened, I'm now sounding like I'm not an optimist, one of the bad things that's happened in the last 45 years um, is the growth of food-related phobias, anorexias, bulimias. You know, when I was just finishing my doctorate, I met Susie Orbach and the, the, the wonderful work that she pioneered about uh, uh, women and body shape, etc. Um, it's actually men and body shape as well, and children and teenagers being targeted. I think getting cooking is partly a way of getting back at the Instagram world where you're defined by some celeb who looks like a sylph and is probably um, bulimic uh, or, or controlled in some other way. That cultural, what I call mass psychological um, element, it seems to me is a really big challenge ahead. It's what, you know, right at the beginning, I nearly said this then, but it's nice to say it now. You know, regaining control over the mass psychology of food, it seems to me is a really big challenge. And that's why, you know, corporate world, what is it? I mean, I'm always quoting this. It's Coca-Cola's budget, the biggest food and drink company on the planet. A Coca-Cola's budget, marketing budget, advertising budget is twice the entire budget for all health of the World Health Organization. So one company there. We've got to wrench back control from that. Say no to them and you're saying yes to yourself. So this leads, we're almost sadly to time, a quick answer from you both, but relevant to what you've just said. Um, Tim, um, out from Andrew Dutson, would more structured cookery nutrition education in schools like there used to be, or even in a new way, uh, give a significant help to all these problems, to our diet, but all these problems we're talking about today? Dee, would... Um, yeah, most, most definitely. But because schools don't value um, cookery and food like how they value maths. And that's, you know, it just isn't done. So we as a society need to value food as the most important thing next to water and fresh air. Tim? 
Would it help? Um, I think cookery does help. Um, I've spent a long time in the 90s campaigning for cooking to be brought back into the curriculum. We sort of got there with help from an obscure cook, uh, Jamie Oliver, who did a great job and continues. And Henry Dibbleby did a very good job um, under the Conservatives trying to keep some of that going. But I, I, I'll tone it down a bit. I think cooking on its own is not the answer. It's so long term. And let me just tell you, Sheila D and Polly, the data say we have to have massive change from food in 25 years. And, and we can't wait for sort of infants to become mature adults to do that. We've got to begin a really big process of change. So I'd like adults to learn to cook, not just children. But I want to say there's another C that matters. And that's competition policy. Uh, you know, there is a very powerful group of companies uh, who dominate food. And if we want democracy in food, we must get more of a grip over this. What's a good market economy, it seems to me, is a really big principle. Markets matter if we're bothered about mouths, not just cooking. Oh, Tim. I mean, I, I feel we, we have to bring this to a close. And I feel it's just getting you know, just goes on being stimulating and thought provoking. And I want to thank you very much, but and it's been fascinating for me. And I have to hand you back to Polly Russell, the mistress of it all. So <laughs> and our audience, and I'm sorry, I couldn't get to more questions. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you, Sheila. I've never been called the mistress of it all, but I'm delighted that was so thought provoking, incredibly interesting. What a privilege and a pleasure to have the three of you with your expertise, your passion, your knowledge around this subject. I mean, really it could have, I mean, we really could go on for so much longer, uh, but so much for people to think about. I'm going to sort of, there's so much I'm taking away, but the two things which I'm going to sort of resonate in me were Dee's words that this is about people coming together and trusting in the power of community. And also, um, this cookery book, which I will be looking up as soon as I go back to, to the British Library that Tim mentioned, uh, Cooking is a Revolutionary Act. Which indeed it is, just what wonderful thoughts to leave with. So thank you so much. Thank you so much to our audience who've really asked a lot of wonderful questions, which unfortunately we did not have time for. If you've enjoyed uh, this session, which I'm sure you have, uh, really do stick around uh, at four o'clock. We've got this follow on um, free event called uh, Beyond the Bank, building um, culture and community through food. So relevant, really builds on what we've been talking about just now with some amazing organizations from across the country Bristol Square Food Foundation, Community Unity in Leeds, My Grateful and Brixton People's Kitchen, all talking about the amazing work they do. So that's free today. That starts at four. Um, and then later on this week, I'll just mention one event because also relevant in relation to what we've been talking about. We've got the wonderful Carolyn Steele, who I know everybody <laughs> well um, uh, an event about the book that she's just recently written called Cytopia how food can save the world and she will be in conversation with Kath Delmaney who is uh, who works for as director of Sustain the Alliance for Better Food and Farming and two uh, you know more engaging lively fun <laughs> people in talking about food you can't imagine other than this panel who have been amazing so Thank you to the panel. Thank you to the audience. Thank you to KitchenAid for sponsoring this event. Uh, I hope to see you all in 20 minutes. Go and make a cup of tea. See you soon.